If you're a fan of Nintendo's earlier consoles, it's a safe bet there'll be an aftermarket shell out there to customise your consoles and controllers and give them that retro look. In this video, I'll be showing you how to replace your Joy-Cons outer shells and give them added functionality with a D-pad added to the control layout. Hi, and welcome back to The Shed. I'm Joe Bleeps, and I love that we can fit replacement shells onto consoles and controllers to give them a whole new look and feel. So when my friend Sam got his Super Famicom style Joy-Con shell kit from Extreme Ray, I was only too happy to volunteer my services when it came to their installation. Was it a difficult job? Let's take a look. So, this pair of Joy-Cons is actually in great shape, but I can sympathise with that need for a change now and then, and well, you know when you find out that something exists and you've just got to have it? Yeah, that. Which brings us to this replacement shell kit from Extreme Rate. This is the Super Famicom, or European Super Nintendo, style Joy-Con kit, which comes nicely presented in a sturdy box made of corrugated cardboard with a little window on the top and vacuum form tray inserts for all the parts, which are held neatly inside. The shells themselves in the top tray come in perfect condition despite not being individually wrapped, with a bag of screws and buttons and a really nifty looking screwdriver stored in the lower section. Looking at the shells themselves, you can see that each is made up of three parts. There's a front and back shell and also a mid frame which is particularly important when you have the neon controllers because this part is also bright blue or red and if you just had replacement outer shells you'd end up being able to see this between the trigger buttons when the new shell is fitted as was the case when I've done this sort of job in the past. So in this case we've got a nice subtle black plastic for the mid frame to match the buttons instead. You can see here that the shell parts are actually white plastic with a soft touch printed layer on the outside so time will tell how well that wears but for now it feels good and it looks great. The three parts for each all fit together neatly and you'll notice one of the distinctive things about this kit is that it actually has a d-pad in place of the original four buttons which means you'll be compromised if you're using it as an individual controller even though the four directions still function as four buttons. It's a small compromise though especially when it comes to using both controllers. It is a much better method of control and it looks great, absolutely in keeping with that Super Famicom theme. At the base of the right controller shell you'll see an opening. This is for the infrared camera so there is a bit more to do when it comes to rehousing the right hand Joy-Con. The D-pad is actually quite a different shape to the original Super Nintendo D-pad with a pronounced dip in the middle but it felt pretty promising on first inspection. In the first bag we have eight buttons. I'm assuming it's the same bag that comes with the non-D-pad version of the kit because not only does it have the A, B, X and Y buttons but also a set with directional markers too. The buttons have the letters in indented. It's a shame there isn't a plain set like there is with the original Super Nintendo buttons, especially when the labels are already on the shell, but it's a minor gripe with an otherwise excellent kit. There's a bag of screws that I'm unlikely to use. If you still have them, I find it's always a good idea to keep the original screws when you're rebuilding any consoles or controllers. It saves a lot of frustration as the screws are often rubbish when it comes to kits like these. There is also a pair of inserts for the bundled screwdriver kit, which is an unusual feature as you'd normally get red, clear, plastic ones. Why is it always clear, red, plastic? And this more substantial metal screwdriver does make the kit feel more like a premium product. Well, at least until you try and use it. Wait and see. Here's an awesome looking anodized gold driver handle with a threaded chuck at the top where the two bits can be placed. Maybe a little bit of an inconvenience to keep swapping them over rather than just have two separate screwdrivers, but I often swap bits over with my wow stick electric screwdriver and that doesn't really bother me. So I decided to start with the left Joy-Con because it's a simpler job of the two and I was curious to see how the D-pad felt once it was assembled. I opened the chuck on the screwdriver, put the Y-wing bit in place, tightened it up, went to undo the first screw and felt a crunch. It looked like damage had been done and I groaned, hoping that the screw head hadn't been stripped. I have done that in the past. So I pushed more firmly while turning, but still the screw didn't budge. On further inspection, it became clear that the metal on the driver bit was just too soft and had completely broken away when it was placed under any sort of torsion or strain. It's really disappointing and it just goes to show it doesn't matter how fancy your gear looks if it's not fit for purpose it's no good to anyone. So I gave it a try with my trusty UPO cheap red drivers that I got with the Gullah Kit Hall sensor joysticks and they worked perfectly. Despite looking cheap these drivers have been excellent it just goes to show appearances can be deceptive. 
At this point, I felt bad for anyone buying this kit and attempting to fit the shells themselves, relying on the included tools. It'd just be so frustrating to deal with and it could end up with other parts being damaged, as well as that knock to the confidence. You know, if, if you're new to modding, especially when this is known as a difficult job to carry out anyway, it'd just really put you back a few steps. Fortunately, I've got the right tools for the job here and I use my Xiaomi Wowstick electric screwdriver for quick disassembly with the red screwdrivers coming in handy for carefully putting screws into fresh holes, cutting new threads and avoiding over tightening. As well as screwdrivers, I'd recommend a separator tool to get into those awkward gaps, a spudger to help with lifting and resetting the ribbon clamps and battery connectors and a good pair of tweezers for when there's those gaps that are a bit too small for your fingers and thumbs to comfortably get into. Anyway. Back to the Joy-Con, having tested the UPO screwdriver successfully, I swapped to the WOW stick with the Y1.0 bit and quickly removed the four tri-wing screws on the back of the Joy-Con. I then used the separator tool, starting at one corner and making my way around the edge, feeling the sections pop apart. A slight twist will lift it away, but be careful of the two ribbons connecting both halves. Remove the battery by lifting it with the spudger and be aware that there is some double-sided tape holding it in place. When it's out, carefully pull the wiring away from its clip. There was one silver Phillips screw holding the inner assembly on the back panel and two gold colored Phillips screws holding the inner frame in place as well as one on the bottom edge too. I placed the screws in the new part that helped me remember which went where. Carefully lift out the inner frame. It's also attached with a small ribbon for the trigger button. Taking a quick look at the ribbon assembly, there are four clamps holding different ribbons in place. You just lift the lever to release the clamp, starting with the trigger button's ribbon to separate the inner frame. To remove the trigger button, put the separator tool between the frame and the button and it will pop off. There are two clips holding it in place. It does put up a little resistance, but it will work. Again, run it round the edge with a little twist to release. This reveals a little board held in place with a single Phillips screw. Undo this and immediately reinstall it into the new frame. Be careful when putting in the screw as you cut in a new thread in the plastic. To put the trigger back on, place the two springs in the little donut shaped holes on the frame and then align the two pegs on the trigger with the other end of the springs, carefully maneuvering into position and applying pressure to re-engage the clip. Give it a quick press to double check it's all assembled correctly and then you can pop the mid frame to one side. Next, separate the two halves by unclipping the two connecting ribbons. They've got these clips on opposite sides, so watch out for that. I'd recommend removing the shoulder button ribbon first as it leaves a little clearance to get the other two ribbons out. Looking at the rail, it has two blue buttons on it and there's no replacement part for that, but to be honest, I'm happy leaving those in the original color and not having the hassle of any further disassembly. Putting the rear half together is easy, but don't forget about the little black button for the release catch. Move that over first, then put the rail in place. There's just that single silver screw to secure it and that's it. Pop the rear shell to one side, onto the main section next. There's the rumble motor at the bottom, the joystick and its ribbon and the motherboard. Unclip the joystick ribbon before you move forward. Take out the joystick first by removing the two gold screws. Lift it out from the shell and carefully remove the ribbon from its socket. The shoulder button lifts out easily and then you're ready to start undoing screws and transplanting parts to the new shell. Undo the three screws at the top for the shoulder button ribbon and remove that part. Then take out the silicon membrane and the minus button, drop it in the new shell, add the silicon membrane over the top and then put the ribbon back in place with the three screws. Again, these are screws going into new holes, so go slowly. Make sure they're aligned properly and don't over tighten them. Next, there's the dust shield for the joystick that's held in place with a couple of sticky pads. It's worth removing any dust while it's out of the shell before putting it back into the new one. Look for the two little cross shaped bumps that the little holes locate around and then push the sticky pads back down in place. Back to the original shell and you'll need to pull the rumble motor out of place. It does need a fair pull, but you just got to be careful with the wiring as it dislodges and then remove the two screws that are holding the motherboard in place. Lift out the motherboard and as you'll see, the silicon membrane is needed for the D-pad to work. Locate the D-pad in the front shell. You don't need the face buttons, but the small square button will need moving over. Don't forget it's silicon membrane too. Put the motherboard back in and put the two screws in place that you've just removed. I looked at the original mid frame to work out which screws to put in as there are a few holes to choose from at this point. To get a good thread in place, wiggle the screw as it goes in with a sort of clockwise, anti-clockwise motion. With the screws in place, a quick check of the D-pad was really impressive. I wasn't sure what to expect, but it really did feel great with the little clicky buttons underneath it. 
push the rumble motor in place and then you'll be reinstalling the joystick. There are a few ways to do this. In this case, I put the ribbon in place first with the aid of some tweezers and then put the stick through the hole, being careful not to disrupt the positioning of that dust guard. And then putting the two gold screws in place at the corners, being careful to avoid the little ribbon that still comes down from the shoulder button. Now the ribbon won't sit flat so don't worry if there's a bit of a bump, if it feels like it's properly inserted it probably is. Before attaching the shoulder button's ribbon cable it's best to do the two that will connect the side rail in place first. Lift the tabs, insert the ribbons and then flip them down remembering that the tabs flip down in a different direction for each ribbon. Now for the shoulder button ribbon it's a bit tricky because the joystick base gets in the way but once you locate it it goes in fairly easily. I use the tweezers to hold the ribbon in place while I use my spudger to flip the catch down and hold it in position. Now we attach the mid frame and this ribbon is a little awkward but if you're patient it's not that bad. Just get it in place, clip it down first with the mid frame out of the way. Relocate the shoulder button, making sure the spring is located. It's best to push it in a little bit further once it's in position. The spudger is great for this. Now the mid frame flips over and you can locate it in place. Insert the three gold screws in those three remaining holes. Next up, the battery. Now last time I did a Joy-Con reassembly, I had some power issues because I hadn't fully clipped that tab in place. So make sure you feel a good click and do a visual check to make sure it sits flat. It's easier to engage the clip and then lay the battery in position after that. Put the two halves of the shell together, making sure the little tabs on the shell line up with the rail. And once those are in place, pinch the other side to feel it click together. Check that everything is properly in place and then you can put the four long black tri-wing screws in, get them all in place before going around again and gently tightening them up afterwards to ensure that the case is held firmly together without too much strain on the plastic. It helps to pinch the parts together while you nip up the screws. The light and dark grey looked good, the parts fitted very neatly together and the whole setup looked and felt great. Now remember, by doing this, you will be voiding any warranty you had before. So do bear that in mind because we all know they are prone to drifting. If you want to eliminate drift altogether, consider the Hall Effect joysticks. I recently did a video about they are really good. Now onto the other Joy-Con. Again, remove the four tri-wing screws, then use the separating tool to pop the shell apart and separate the two halves of the controller. Now this one has the infrared camera and the Amiibo scanner, which means a few more parts and wires inside. There's a small antenna board to move out of the way before using the spudger to pop the battery out. Now take your time because you don't want to damage, bend or twist the battery. Once it's out, unclip the battery cable and put it to one side. This time the screws are in a different place because the stick is lower down. There are two gold screws at the top and one at the bottom. Move the wire and the little board out of the way and lift up the mid frame. But be careful, the ribbon from the trigger is much shorter on this one and very fiddly to get at. I find it's easiest to remove the ribbon with the frame on its edge like this, but there's not really an easy option. Again, just be patient and <laughs> know that it's even more difficult when you're trying to get it back in later. There's tabs on either side of the end of the ribbon, so I use the pointed end of the spudger to lift the catch and then the tweezers to push on those two tabs and remove the ribbon. Put in the main assembly to one side, get your new mid frame and start the process of moving the parts over from the old one. Use the separating tool to pop off the trigger again, remove the single screw to remove the button PCB and move it straight over to the new shelf. Then your springs again go into the new holes, locate them on the nubs under the trigger and with those lined up push on the trigger and it should just snap in place. Now if it doesn't go in you're likely in the wrong spot so just double check that if you need to. Next, the back shell again. Unclip the two ribbons that have the clips facing in opposite directions and remove those. Undo the screw holding the rail in place and lift it out. Move the little button over to the new shell, then put the rail section in place and put the screw in the new shell. Detach the shoulder button and the spring, release the joystick ribbon and undo the two gold joystick screws and carefully ease it out of the shell, removing the ribbon too. There's more to deal with at the bottom, but not everything needs undoing. There are two screws to get out. It's worth noting where they go. I didn't, and it caused me a little confusion afterwards. Lift out the rumble motor and you'll see a ribbon underneath it, but you can lift out the entire assembly quite easily, revealing the pad underneath for the Amiibo reader. Move the home button over and get the replacement buttons if you're gonna need them. So I'm not using the original black buttons here as I've got the Super Famicom color scheme instead with this set. There are a load of tabs and gaps to make sure you get the buttons all in the right place and the right way up, so you can't really go wrong there. Don't forget the plus button and its rubber membrane though. The Amiibo reader is stuck down and you'll need to carefully detach it by lifting it with tweezers and then using the spudger to separate the layers and it should pop off fairly easily. 
you're left with the joysticks dust card that gets removed, cleaned and attached to the new shell as before. It's easier to put the Amiibo reader in place before putting the silicon membrane onto the home button. After that, the motherboard should flip over, line up, and you can put those two screws back in place. Make sure it aligns properly before the screws go in. The buttons and pads may slip and need carefully relocating like mine did here. After this, I went to great pains to try and remember which holes these two screws went into. Just do it like I ended up doing here, it is in the right spot. Locate the infrared camera in position and put the rumble motor back in its slot, pushing it firmly in place. Then put the joystick in. This time I did the stick first and then the rib and the tweezers helped me put it in place and then clip it down. After that, I put the two gold screws in to secure the joystick. Now the two ribbons need relocating to attach the rear shell. Same as before, insert them both and clamp them down. Next, the shoulder button goes in place, followed by the mid frame and its ribbon, which I find to be the hardest part of this whole process. So I found it best to grip the ribbon with tweezers and let the frame just hang to one side. You put the ribbon so it just goes into the slot and then put the whole assembly down and use the tweezers to push the ribbon in place and the spudger to flick the catch down until it finally secures flat. After this, it all gets a lot easier. Locate the mid frame, put the three gold screws in place to secure it. Be careful to make sure the little antenna board and wire are out of the way before those screws go in. Now the battery, put the cable clip in place first and use the spudger to snap it down. The battery sits flat and sticks down again. This little antenna board and its wire need to go around the small channel around the battery before they slot in place. The spudger is really useful to help nudge the wire in place here. Almost done now, just relocate the rear shell as before, start on the rail side making sure the tabs are located, then flip it over, pop the clips together on the other side and put your four tri-wing screws in to finish. Job done. I was really impressed with the end result, especially after getting off to a rocky start with that awful screwdriver. I love how it turned out. The print quality is clean, the buttons feel good, and as a pair, they look excellent. A proper throwback to Nintendo consoles of yesteryear with a lovely modern twist. I gave them a tryout on my Switch. They located nicely without any wobble. As the original side rail has been kept with the colored buttons, it's easy to spot which is which, and they paired no problem. And when I checked for calibration and vibration, they were all fine. The end result really does look great, although of course they clash horribly with the back of my Pokemon Switch. But in general, they look absolutely brilliant and so authentic. And that's it. It took me around an hour and a half all in, but to be honest, if I wasn't filming and narrating as I went along, it would probably have been closer to an hour. For a relatively inexpensive upgrade that's tricky at times, but not as bad as some people may have you believe, it's definitely a worthwhile mod to do if you want to transform the look of your Nintendo Switch. As I said earlier though, the tools, they're the real letdown here. If you want a nice, straightforward experience, then you've just got to make sure that you have all the right tools before you start. In this case, a good pair of screwdrivers, a separating tool, a spudger, and a pair of tweezers. They really made the whole job so much easier. If I was stuck with that supplied screwdriver, I wouldn't even have got past the first screw, but the shell, wow, the shell is fantastic. So this was from Amazon and it's made by Extreme Rate. There's also a wide range of Joy-Con shells as well as a load of high quality modding tools available from Z-Labs where you can get a 5% discount using the code JOEBLEEPS at the checkout. If you use the affiliate link in the description, you'll also be helping out this channel with a little bit of commission at no extra cost to you. I'd really appreciate that. If you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe. And if you haven't already, sign up for notifications. I'm uploading content weekly at the moment with the odd midweek bonus. So make sure you get the heads up when any new content drops. This is Joe Bleeps signing out from the shed. If you want to keep watching me, then there should be a few videos here for you to watch. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.